Because if you've hung around me long enough, you know I talk a lot. So I, I've been into the sermon 30 minutes before I remember praying. So I figured, let me go ahead and do this first. Right? And I would love to start off this lesson by talking at length about the great Ohio State game yesterday. You know, I, you know, if we were in Ohio, I'd probably have a whole sermon built around the game. But since we're in Alabama country, where Alabama and Auburn both had a bye yesterday, we'll have to float a little quickly through the Ohio State part. But if you didn't watch the game yesterday, you saw a fantastic finish if you're an Ohio State fan. Because they played bad. And they still won. They did not help themselves much. But you know, I was like, you know, there's a good principle in there. Because I have played my life bad and still come out with God. So there's always a good principle in there when you see people overcome a whole lot of hardship then end up being victorious. But you know, you know, we used to have football updates every single Sunday until Frank Davis's team, the Florida State Seminoles, forgot how to play football. We used to have an update every single week. We used to go to Auburn and Alabama, Florida State, Ohio State, go through it all. Wow. One in six later, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> wow. But you know, you saw this great fighter spirit in the game yesterday, if you watch. And it's kind of woven into our society. You know, it's pretty anti-American to think about surrender. Yeah, that's right. And the name of the sermon today is Surrender. Right? And Frank, is, God has been using Frank in an amazing way uh, uh, to, on this series about the prodigal son. And this is the fourth lesson uh, out of a series that will uh, go on for another week or two. And in a sense that he started off with brokenness, or excuse me, rebellion, brokenness, redemption, and now we're moving into surrender. And now we're getting into the meat of really our part as people. Because there's not a whole lot we bring to the table with God besides our surrender. But you know, surrender is very anti-American. I mean, we're the land of the free, we're the home of the brave. We don't lose wars, we obliterate wars, right? And then our families probably instilled that further. One of the main lessons I remember that my father constantly teaching me as I grew up was not to quit. You better not quit. He'd take me in the backyard. We play one-on-one -on -one football. Grown man versus little boy. You better not quit. Even in my daughter, when she was, we were looking at her in ultrasound. And the first time I saw her, she was jumping up and down inside my wife, killing her with pain. And the nurse goes, ooh, nasty baby. She's feisty. And she is not disappointed because she has been feisty since she has came out the womb. Surrender is far from her lips. Far, far, far. And, you know, maybe you can relate as a father because if you grew up in the colossal household, there's going to be some wrestling that goes on. And even though she's a young lady, I still feel like she needs to learn how to get out of a few holes. So she may just be innocently watching some TV and come across a headlock. Find your way out! Find your way out! Because I'm a teacher, she might need to know that at some point, right? How to get out of a headlock. Because there are some chucklehead boys around that she might need that skill. Exactly. But you know, even myself, my first words out of my mouth were no. My grandfather was trying to teach me how to walk. Coming from his day and age, he didn't take too kindly to a child telling him no. Right? But it's deep within me, it's deep within you too, to not surrender. So we gotta figure out how we can process God's word in a way and understand why is it so important to God that we surrender? Wow. 
So let's turn over to Luke chapter 15. We're going to keep working away here at the prodigal of the lost son here. Because we got some choices to make as people of whether we're going to be fighting the good fight for God or whether we're going to fight against Him. There's really no in between. We're choosing one or the other. But when we look at Luke, let's start in chapter 15, verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. You know, sometimes it's a long road for us to come to our senses. You know, I, I don't know where you're at in your walk with God today, and whether you do know him as he wants to be known, or whether you're just considering that aspect of the relationship. But I know for me that I got a lot of scars along the way until I was willing to say, I'm going to come to my senses. You know, and just like this young man went his own way and did things the way he wanted to, taking his inheritance, which essentially told his father that you're dead to me, because that's something you get when you die, and did his own thing and went his own way, I can totally relate with that in my life. Because, see, y'all were supposed to be watching me on TV today. I was supposed to make it to the NFL. And I would break anything, whether it was other people or myself, to get there. We could talk at length. I, I have a list of things I could roll out of the things I did to try to make it. To try to enforce my will upon life. But to only see God not only humble me, but all the circumstances around my life, just like this young man. See, because it wasn't enough that he squandered all the wealth. He went to a distant country where nobody knew him. And that country went through a famine. But he didn't plan on that. Then people would not even help him. You'd think if you were hungry, somebody would give you a piece of bread, right? But when God's serious about us coming back to him, he'll withhold that piece of bread. See, because God and his desire and his grace, none of these circumstances were too great for him. If God didn't want that young man to go through a famine, it, there wouldn't have been a famine. If God wanted him to get some help and get some food, he'd have got some food. But God withheld all of that help from him so that he could come back to his senses. Wow. Wow. See, it wasn't enough for me. I was so arrogant that I remember I was, I was riding home. I was playing college football at Ohio State. And this trainer was giving me a ride because I was walking to practice. And he said, you know what? You should be grateful because not many freshmen play. And I looked at him and I said, not even God can stop me from playing at this school. And I started to even get better at what I was doing. Spring practice, I was getting reps all over the place. I was playing well. I played well in the spring game. And then, right before the second season started, a week before the season started, 
I pulled my hamstring, finishing up our conditioning test. A conditioning test I had been practicing for all summer. I was at Ohio State all summer training. And then all of a sudden I pull a hamstring. And then I get injury after injury after injury. But not just any kind of injury where everybody sees me walking with a knee brace. Or everybody sees me with a cast. I, I get all the injuries that people start questioning how tough you are. Why aren't you back in practice yet? And I have to red shirt for the whole season. Never to play another down at Ohio State University. Leaving in shame as the player who couldn't get healthy. But see, that didn't do it for me. So I had to go all the way across the country to another place to play football and still trucking along in my pride. And God had to take my ability to play away from me. And it wasn't until I was on my back and my mother was bringing me a bedpan so I could use the restroom while I was 20 years old until I came to my senses. And I started to think, you know what? There's probably more to life than football. But see, God goes through these great lengths to help us come to our senses. But you know, the challenge is staying surrendered. Because I'm sure you have some stories too of where God has humbled you and you came to your senses. Right. But you know, it's pretty hard to stay serene. Right. It's pretty hard to stay serene. Right. Because my heart doesn't stop trying to wander away. Right. That rebellion that's deep within me doesn't just easily surrender each day. And so whether this is your first time in the beginning of a relationship with God or whether you're like me and you, now you're at a stage where you're just struggling to stay surrendered, there's a part we have to embrace and take some responsibility for. Because Satan seems to attack me in stages now. He wants to kind of get his foot on in one area of my life and entrench himself and then move further. Usually has the same pattern every time. First thing he wants me to do is stop spending time with God. Too busy. It ain't going to help anyway. Not long after that, I'm fighting with everybody around me. Wife, child, brother, sister, doesn't matter. Somebody in here. I'm fighting. I don't know what I'm fighting for, but I'm fighting. Right? Fighting everybody. You know why? Because it's in me. I dare you tell me not to quit. I'm going to win something around here. That's real. And if I told you to take out the trash, you better not take it out the trash. <laughs> but you know, something that I keep coming back to time and time again as I beat my own head against the wall time and time again is that my plans don't work. And that the only way that this works, my relationship with God, is when I'm surrendering. Come on. Come on. It's the only way it works. That's right. So write this down in your notes. I'm going to read a separate verse to you. Luke 14, 28 through 33. Luke 14, 28 through 33. We're going to go over two points here today. The first one is counting the cost. So we're looking at what are the keys to surrender. The first one is counting the cost. And so Luke 14, 28 through 33, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Why don't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. When we first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for the terms of peace. 
In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Man, that's a hard teaching, isn't it? If I'm honest right now, it bothers me. It hurts me. Because it sounds all too familiar to the uncompromising coaches I've had my whole life. It sounds too familiar to the coaches who at a distance didn't seem connected to the pain that you were in as a player and told you to run again. And it didn't matter how much it hurt. You just ran to play again. And so I can get distant from a scripture like this because on the surface, I can just see it as harsh treatment instead of the protection that's involved in it and how God is protecting me from myself. And so why should we agree to such a radical and intense surrender? Well, if we go back to where we were starting, we're going to pick away at the surrender of this prodigal of the lost son and find out. So back over in Luke 15, verse 17. It says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And I'm here starving to death. This prodigal son knew he had a generous father. He knew he had a generous father. Because his father even took care of the hired servants. How many hired servants do you know have food to spare? He knew he was going back to a generous father. But even at that surface level, he had no idea what was waiting for him and how much grace was waiting for him. He only saw it on the surface. And he knew that he had a generous father to go back to when he came to his senses. Reminds me of David, Psalm 84, 10, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. You know, David was known as a man after God's own heart, but he had some egregious failures, just like you and I. But when he messed up and he committed adultery and he planned the murder of a man, or later on, when he did a census that cost over 100,000 people's lives because of his own pride, he still had faith in the grace of God. He still said, God may be gracious with me. Do you see the grace of God in your worst sins? Or is that just for somebody else? Well, if you're going to stay surrendered, got to see how that grace comes to you. No matter how broken we are, no matter how many mistakes that we make, that there's a path back through Christ. Amen. Amen. Do you have faith, like the prodigal son did, that he had a generous father? Chances are, if you do, it's only on the surface level. You have no idea all that God has in store for you. If you come back, if you turn yourself in. See, he knew he was surrendering to someone who was generous. That's why lordship wasn't a problem for him. Because he had done things his way. And he knew that wasn't work. You know, another thing about counting the cost, besides just knowing you're going back to a generous father, is you got to really think through the plan. Right? We read in there about Jesus comparing following him to building a building. Now, I wouldn't just wake up one morning and walk outside and start building a building. I'd have to really think that through. I'm talking about laying down some cement, digging down real deep. I got to do the plumbing, right? We don't want to have an outhouse next to it. Right? Got to have some electricity around here. We're not living in the Stone Age. Right, that's going to take some planning, right? We got some builders in here. So why do we think that our relationship with Christ is kind of like a jacuzzi? I'm cold, let me hop in. It's too hot, let me get out. 
And then we're ridiculed because of our lack of faith to stick to it. And to live out that kind of surrender that God calls for. So let's pick up in verse 18. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So then he got up and went to his father. He had a plan about what he was going to do. Now something to take note of is also what he didn't say he was going to do. Did he say he was going to go back and raise all that money before he went home? You know why? Because he couldn't. If you're thinking you're going to get yourself together before you come to God, you, you're never going to get there. Because you can't get yourself together. There's one thing in life always worth surrendering to. And that's God. And you can get yourself together That's right. without him. That's right. I know I can. That's right. You know, what made this really tough for him, too, to make this confession and this thought process to say, I'm going to go back to my father. See, he went off to a distant country, some Gentile land where he could get away with all that sin. Because see, he couldn't have been living this crazy back there in his Jewish culture. He would have got rebuked every time he turned around. You know that ain't right. You know that ain't right. So he had to go to this secret place to go get down with his sin. Right? He had to go in the dark somewhere far, far away, but then choosing to come back mean that he had to face everybody. And everybody knew why he left. But he wasn't focused on the people, was he? He even said, Father, I've sinned against God, and I've sinned against you, and that's why I'm coming back. That's right. That's right. You know, we got some secret places that people go to to sin now. The World Wide Web is one of them. You know, your wife may not know, your husband may not know, nobody here may know, but you got your secret place. That's right. And you're destroying your life. Nobody knows but you. That's right. But it won't get better until you repent. It won't get better until you turn yourself into God and you confess that you have sinned against God. And you start that road back and come back from that distant country. But we're not coming back to a harsh father who's demeaning to us. We're not coming back to the coach in the skybox who doesn't care how it feels. We're coming back to a God who's already looking for us. Who's waiting for us to surrender. For me, it comes to deepening the conviction. If I'm going to stay surrendered, then counting the cost has to be a regular part of my life. I have to make counting the cost of what it takes for me to be surrendered. That's a daily, sometimes moment by moment decision for me. As a young Christian, I used to think I have a quiet time and I have a good day. Right? Don't have one, have a bad day. My life's not that simple now. Because I can cry out and pray all I want for an hour and then still feel like I'm getting hit in the head all day long. need that time with God and I still need to be surrendered in doing what it takes to have that time and that commitment to God. And what I've established a conviction about in Jeremiah 17 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Look, I can't understand myself. I can't understand how rebellious I am. And neither can you. That's why you need God. That's why we got to turn ourselves in. So we got to count the cost. We can't be worried about people. But then we got to have some deeds next to that faith. James 2.14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith 
but has no deeds, can such faith save them? That's another scripture that makes me uncomfortable. Because it requires something from me. Similar to the other one on surrender and being a disciple, right? The ones that require of us can be very intimidating. Especially if we lose track of the loving Father who's requiring. I don't doubt you have some level of faith of being in this room because you want to hear something about God. But I think something you have to meditate on and think about as we all do. Is do you have saving faith? Do you have the type of saving faith to turn yourself in to surrender to Jesus? And if you've already done that one time a long time ago, do you have the faith to muster up that courage to do it again? Do you see those decisions as a ring of the bell that goes across eternity? That each time one of us surrenders to God, the magnitude and the impact and the ripple that happens in our communities, in our families, for generations to come. Amen. Or is it just about little old hurting us and how we feel? So the prodigal son didn't just think about it. He didn't just count the cost and say that'd be a good idea to do someday. He put action to it. Verse 20. He said, so he got up and went to his father. When's the last time you got up and went to your father? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his son, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. Have you ever been around somebody who was just so sincerely heartbroken, but they were trying to apologize to you? You know, a lot of parents can relate with this, because at some point along the line, you probably come across an apology from the child. Right? I've been in education the last 14, 15, I don't know, a lot of years of my life. Right? Been around a lot of kids. Right? And if you're a parent, you've been around kids, or you've been around people a lot, there's, there's a, a vibe, a sense you get when somebody's apologizing and it's sincere. And when you get that sense that somebody is just broken about what they have done and they're trying to apologize to you, you, you don't even really want to let them finish. At least I hope not, right? I hope I'm not standing back and stopping on a foot and saying, get it out. Let it hurt. and trying to apologize, and she just couldn't get it out. She's just, just crying and just bubbling through her words and trying to get it out, and it was like, I, I, you don't even need to finish. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're back. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's the type of God we're surrendering to. A God who's looking. A God who's ready to love us. A God who's ready to hug us. I can't tell you how much Frank a couple weeks ago was sharing about his own experience with his father. And he started to talk about seeing God as a God who wraps his arm around you and just tells you it's going to be okay. And it stuck with me and it replayed in my head for the last couple weeks. Because that had been a disconnect for me with God. Like, I know my marching orders. Right? I know, God, I got to go do it. I got it. I get it. I know it's going to hurt. I get it. I know I got to go do it. Let me go do it. But I wasn't dealing with it. 
I was just stuffing it way on down, gripping my teeth harder, pulling my bootstraps up more, talking about how hard life is to everybody. Just have that little edge to it, right? That little edge, how you doing today? Fine, it's just, you know, life. Right? Feel good today? No, but I'll be okay. <laughs> what can I pray for you about? Everything. <laughs> Doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> How's your back? Still hurts. <laughs> you know, so, you know, when I'm, when I'm in those moods, even if I'm spending time with God, you know, and I got in one of those moves where I was on the outside, I was still here with everybody, but on the inside, I was far, far away in bitter land. That's real. I had my own party every day. And when I told y'all earlier what I do when I go to bitter land, who do I start fighting against? Everybody. So India was the unlucky target a couple weeks ago. Y'all sitting there like y'all don't pick on people. Uh, no, y'all do too. I'm just the only one airing out the laundry right now. So anyway, I, I had convinced myself that all these problems were India's problems, right? And marriage one on one, that's not a good idea. Never a good idea. Never works. I tried it off and on for 13, 14 years, and now it still hasn't worked. It always comes back to some very hard, humbling times. But I'm hard handling enough that I needed another one. And so I determined that she was wrong about all these things, and if she would just get these things right, then my life would be a whole lot easier. And maybe my life wouldn't be so embittering. And I decided the perfect time to tell her all these things, too. It was Friday right before she went to work. Oh. I know! That's messed up, isn't it? Man, that is so messed up when I think about it. See, I came to my senses now. But in the moment, it just made so much sense. You know, my heart had been wandered away. It was hard. And I'm like, look, you need to get this right now. And let me tell you how you need to get it. And so I, I let her have it. And it didn't go well. And I made this big mess. And then she had to go off to work. And then I'm stuck with this big mess I just made. And I can't go make things right with her because she's at work. Right? We don't have two hours to sit down and talk. And I just got to sit in my mess. So I call a friend. I made a mess. He said, you know, he just, he let me talk. He let me get it all out. He, he did what a loving brother does. He just listened. He listened. And he listened. And then he brought me back to, what do you think God wants you to do? And then he listened. And then he listened. And see, we're about to go take a road trip at Pensacola for a soccer game. All right? And we're about to go do that. And I hadn't been able to go to a yoga class. And I don't like yoga. Just so you know. But it's become necessary for survival for me with my back injuries. So I'm, I'm in there, you know, hey, trying to get my holds and everything. And I'm sitting in the parking lot about to go into a yoga class because I need it more than I can breathe, right? And I'm trying to get some help on the way because let me put a patch on this problem and just move on because life's hard anyway, right? And then he challenges me. And he says, you need to go spend some time with God and be honest with him about how you feel towards God. And I'm like, okay. And I got this war, civil war. You ever have those in your little head? I got, I got this civil war going on. I was like, I need some yoga. I don't need to go pray. Praying ain't gonna help anyway. And thankfully, by the grace
grace of God, I've come back to my senses enough to get in my car, to go back home, and have this very difficult conversation with God that I've been avoiding for a while. Turn with me over to Job, chapter 16. Because, see, now, what I was facing was real. Like, like all my challenges weren't just like my imagination. Okay? It, it wasn't just that I was feeling like life was hard. Life was hard. It was hard beyond anything I could imagine. And if you want to hear more about that story, I'll give you my phone number and I can tell you a longer version of that. But whether it was my health, or whether it was my relationships, or whether it was my job, or whether, no matter what box you checked, life was hard, and it wasn't only hard for a day. In some instances, it's been hard for over a decade. Maybe you can relate with that. Now, I'm talking about a five-minute challenge. We're talking about something you've already poured your heart out time and time again about. So in Job chapter 16, verse 6, this is Job speaking. He says, yet if I speak, my pain is not relieved, and if I refrain, it does not go away. Surely, God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have shriveled me up, and it has become a witness. My darkness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on me his piercing eyes. People open their mouths to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and you and you untie together against me. Excuse me, unite together against me. God has turned me over to the ungodly and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and he crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me without pity. He pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he bursts upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. Maybe you've never felt this way towards God. You will at some point. Maybe you do right now and you just don't want to deal with it. Because it's not a comfortable conversation. See, I know all this is wrong. I know it's wrong for me to be bitter against God. I know it's wrong for me to be angry against God. It still had not stopped it from happening. And so when I go back to my house, I have this awkward time of trying to pray through how I really feel about God. And it wasn't something I could microwave. It wasn't something I could immediately find the words for. It was something that took a long time. And it took the stillness of life to bring out what was laying down deep. But I didn't have any excuses. I put up the phones. I took off work that day. And I'm sitting there at home in my quiet stillness. And I raged out against God. Because he was just a God in the skybox. Telling me to run the play. And it didn't matter how much it hurt. It didn't matter that my knuckles were bleeding. It didn't matter that I couldn't see straight. It didn't matter that I had a hard time walking. It just kept coming. And I told him he was a God in the skybox. He wasn't down there on the field with me. I told Frank before I prayed that I just felt like God was against me. It was time I told him that I didn't talk about him. If I want to have a great relationship with God, I got to talk to him. 
Are you talking to God? Because if we're going to stay surrendered, we've got to go talk to God. And then let him lift us up. You know, God gives grace to the humble. But he opposes the proud. We don't have to go raise all our money like the prodigal son. We just need to do what we can. We need to give all of our heart and come back. Yeah. You can't get yourself right together. I can't get myself together. We just need to go back to God. Right. And let His grace pick us up. Because God listened to me, and then He picked me up. He sent people to check on me. They didn't even know I was struggling. Sent conversation from Porter and Brian. Had Frank follow up with me. He changed things within me so I could be the man I needed to be for other people. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer for me. And to God be the glory. Amen. Father in heaven, Help us remember that you are far above what we understand. You're above the skies, above the stars. You're above all we know. And you reside in a loving way. That you are the God that wraps your arm around us and tells us it's going to be okay. That you are the God that walks with us. You are the coach on the field. You have a good purpose for any pain in our lives. You have a good glory to help others know you. Father, help us muster the courage to make you Lord. To let that be the ringing of a bell that rings throughout eternity. That changes the courses of our lives and the lives of others. Let us remember how important each act of faith, each act of surrender is to you. No matter how small it seems to us, help us unclench our fists on our lives and open up our arms to you. Help us with humble hearts that your word reach down deep within us and change us. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.